there. I apologize. Now that everybody's admitted, I'm going to say this again. Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another, another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed our last episode with Fred Newman and Tony Early, you can go to Bird's Books Write America page and link to the episode easily. I've put that link in the chat. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch on our Write America YouTube channel. Now we are hosting all of our episodes on Zoom, so the recordings will reside on YouTube. All of the earlier episodes, 1 through 32, are there already, and we will place this one there while I continue to move the rest over. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts reading by in conversation with Edvige Junta and Richard Rabinowitz. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Edvige Junta. Edvige Junta is the author of Writing with an Accent, Contemporary Italian-American Women Authors, and co-editor of several anthologies, including The Milk of Almonds, Italian-American Women Writers on Food and Culture and Personal Effects, Essays on Memoir, Teaching, and Culture in the Work of Louise DeSalvo. Her creative nonfiction appears in Creative Nonfiction, Mutha Magazine, Jellyfish Review, December, and other publications. Talking to the Girls, Intimate and Political Essays on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, co-edited with Mary Ann Trasciati, was published in March of this year. She is the professor of English at New Jersey University, where she teaches memoir, flash, and a course on the Triangle Fire. Ed, please welcome to the screen, Edvige Junta. Let me find you. Here I am. Here you are. Thank you so much, Alice. Of course. And what a pleasure um, to be a guest on Write America. I have been enjoying so much uh, the episodes. It's something that I look forward to. I recommend to my friends and my students. Uh, so thank you so much, Alice. And thank you, uh, Roger, for, for including me in this marvelous series. And, and, and what a pleasure to be able to be in conversation um, with you tonight, Richard. Um, so I am the co-editor of um, an anthology um, of personal essays on the Triangle Fire with Marianne Trasciati, as, uh, as Ali said. And so um, tonight I'm going to be reading an excerpt from the introduction, which was co-written, uh, and also a short excerpt from one of the essays, uh, just to give you a sense of what kind of writing um, the authors have done. The introduction is called The Story uh, That Calls to Us. Talking to the Girls is not a book about the Triangle Fire, but about the ways Triangle continues to call to us. It does not tell the stories of Triangle workers. Instead, their stories are remembered, evoked, coaxed out of a distant, often obscure past, and they are entwined with the stories of a son, a grandson, a granddaughter, a great niece, a teacher, a scholar, an art historian, a labor historian, a writer, a poet, an architect, a labor organizer, an activist. The labor tragedy that killed 146 people in 1911 is personal, 
not only for families, co-workers and fellow citizens, but also for people who may have no direct relation to Triangle. Organizers, reporters, politicians, artists, writers, scholars, teachers. Ask anyone who has been involved in Triangle Fire activism and I will tell you a story. It became personal for the reporter William Gunn Shepherd, the March 25th, 1911. He wrote, I looked up, saw that there were scores of girls at the windows. The flames from the floor below were beating in their faces. Somehow I knew that they too must come down. And something within me, something that I didn't know was there, stilled me. It became personal for Frances Perkins, who later became the US Secretary of Labor and the first woman to join a US presidential cabinet. Perkins was having tea with a friend the day of the fire. A commotion drew her to the factory. The horrors she witnessed drove her to dedicate her life's work to ensuring that tragedies like Triangle would never happen again. A century later, Susan Harris, the artist of the Shirtwaist Project, remembering their prayers, and granddaughter of Triangle factory owner Max Blanc, experiences the memory of the fire as, quote, a certain sorrow that's in your blood, in your genes, end quote. Performer Lulu Lolo is overcome with emotion when she realizes that 10 of the women who died in the fire came from the East Harlem neighborhood where she lived, as did Lulu's parents and immigrant grandparents. We had family who worked in the factories, she says, we knew this world. Lolo's triangle inspired performances, including her one woman play soliloquy for a seamstress, resonate with this intimate knowledge as does Harris's shirtwaist project. There is a collective spirit at the core of Triangle and the community that's grown in its memory. From the union and labor organizing that led to the 1909 uprising, to the funerals for the seven unidentified victims, to the political and commemorative efforts that followed, the history of Triangle is the history of people coming to make together to, mo to mourn and to fight for social justice. Talking to the girls celebrates the diversity of the work inspired by the Triangle Fire at the beginning of the 21st century. Many of us who are part of this project first met at the annual commemoration on a panel discussion, a performance, a march, a community meeting, or through reading one another's work. Often a single encounter has generated lifelong collaboration. The impetus to create a volume of personal essays emerged from these acts of collaboration that define the Triangle community. We, the editors, came to this work as feminist scholars and teachers committed to working class issues and as women with immigrant roots in Italy. I am a first generation immigrant and Marianne is the granddaughter of immigrants. Our interest in the Triangle Fire started at different times and in different places. For me, in 1976, when, as an adolescent, I talked about the fire in an episode of a feminist radio program I hosted in my Sicilian hometown, and a year later, when I participated in a feminist march on the streets of Catania. For Marianne, at home on Long Island, where she listened to stories about her mother's work in a dress factory, and later when she learned about Triangle in middle school in the late 1970s. I have taken the students from my Triangle Fire course to the annual Triangle Fire commemoration. I have stood with them in front of the Brown Building, listening to Marianne speak as president of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Marianne and I have walked together to the home addresses of girls killed by the fire and knelt next to our Austria University and New Jersey City University students to write in chalk on the sidewalk the names of workers who died in the fire. We talked about what makes all of us involved in Triangle a community. This community, we believe, understands that the meaning of history is found in the realization of its continuous relevance in the present and for the future. 
We trusted that the personal essay would serve as an ideal form, form to explore the combination of intimate and political that permeates triangle activism. Whether it manifests as political action or artistic, literary, or pedagogical work. The only a handful of personal narratives on the Triangle Fire had appeared in print, and this with the exception of, of course of Leon Stein's book, The Triangle Fire, which includes interviews with the survivors. The, so that only a handful of personal narratives had been published strengthened our belief that the personal essay was the necessary form for our book. We hoped that by remembering and reflecting on their own triangle stories, contributors would express a transformative and exemplary process of cultural and historical self-awareness. Sometimes they involved grounding their experiences in cross-generational stories. If, to use Vivian Gornick's distinction, the triangle fire is the situation our authors have in common, we ask them to distill, uncover, and tell us their triangle fire stories. They bring to the page the triangle experiences which are rooted in a wide range of contexts, the family, the union, the classroom, the archive, the place of origin. The essays coalesce around memoristic moments where commitment to triangle activism and personal story intersect. These are moments of great insight for the authors and we hope for readers as they illustrate how history is not indifferent to our actions. Writing can transform our relationship to the past by generating not just new perspective, but new feelings. Memorist Luis de Salvo writes, language I learned by writing gives birth to feeling, not the other way around. Memory work central to triangle history makes an author a vulnerable actor. Someone who examines their own place in history is one way to bring the past into the present. In looking at their encounter with the fire and what prompted them to find a place in their lives for triangle, these authors offer models for engaging in and reflecting on activism that are applicable to other historic events. We did not conceive talking to the girls as a collection, but as a conversation. For this reason, we did not include the previously published essays. All the essays were written for this book. We asked our contributors to weave their private memories with public memory of Triangle. They have done so in ways that are dramatically different, even as they resonate with one another. These essays traverse different forms of the personal essays. Some are primarily memoristic, others move back and forth between the memoristic and the scholarly, the cultural, or the pedagogical. In every case, they are acts of intimate and political memory that show how our present selves are shaped by an encounter with the past. And now I will read a short excerpt from uh, the essay that opens the book, uh, um, Anna, Another Spring by Anne Van Zillot. I am not a factory worker, nor am I an immigrant, but I relate to these girls. I began to chalk soon after we had been evicted from our Brooklyn apartment in a ramped wave of gentrification in 2007. My life and the life of my family were vulnerable to the landlord class which I saw as part of the same money lasting fabric as the triangle bosses who had locked the workers in the factory. Neighborhood thoroughfares filled with mom and pop businesses would soon be replaced by generic franchises and pre-war buildings would catapult to market rates of millions of dollars. The Park Slope neighborhood where we lived, where my uncle Frank was once an iceman now hemorrhaged working class and artist residents. Full-time artists, middle-aged, working class, and LGBTQ, we were the people who lost our apartments, left our neighborhoods, and scattered to other people's homes, states, or countries. We had held out as long as we could, but one by one, despite our best hopes and strategies, 
we surrendered. Our community was shredded. I finally understood that cliche, tearing the fabric of society. That's what it felt like, the shearing of a community. Over the years, we've each ponied up several hundred thousand dollars in rent. We have paid the ticking meter of time. We have bought the privilege of living within the city limits on a dead end path to losing our homes and each other as neighbors and community members. The history of New York City as a home became a life for me in new ways when I began to chalk. The first names, Ruth Sergo, the creator of the Chalk Project, assigned me were Milly Prato, Rosie Bassino, and Rosie Grasso. 93 McDougall Street was new when Milly Prato lived there, built in 1900. In 2018, it rented for $58 a square foot, or $3,472 per month for a one bedroom apartment. Realtors boast that it is in the center of the action, less than, than a five minute walk to Washington Square Park. A walk Milly Prato knew well to the factory where seamstresses earned a dime an hour on 12 hour shifts. In 1925, the San Remo Cafe opened on the ground floor on 93 McDougall where Bohemians and Beats hung out. Gore Vidal famously flirted at the bar with Jack Kerouac. In 2008, I got down on my knees on the sidewalk outside 93 and chalked Milly Prato's name and address in the years of her birth and death. From the sidewalk, I looked up at the facade of the building as a locus for Milly Prato's life, somewhere to place her alive, a doorway she pushed open, the roof over her head, the threshold that she stepped through to come home where she would never return on March 25th, 1911. I pictured Milly turning her head, glancing at someone on the street and saying, ciao, as she walked into the building. 97 West Houston, where Rosie Bassino lived, no longer existed in 2008. For Rosie, I walked fastidiously up and down Houston Street to hypothesize where number 97 must have been between West Broadway and Thompson. I chose a spot to the right of a fancy store whose windows reflected the shiny yellow streaks of taxi traffic. Chopped her names and dates, shouted, Rosie, up at the sky over the monolith building that spanned the block and waited. I imagined Rosie looking both ways, laughing, crossing Houston southward on her way home from her shift. 174 Thompson Street was next to a Japanese restaurant in 2008. The kitchen workers routinely sat smoking on the step in front of what had once been Rosie Grasso's front door. I called her name up at the building and down the street. Then I got down on the sidewalk and chalked. Rosie Grasso, was always the most vivid in my imagination, partly because of her age, 16. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, Ed Vij, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Richard Rabinowitz. Richard Rabinowitz tells stories of the American past through museum, exhibitions, films, family histories, and memoirs. As president of American History Workshop, he has planned and curated dozens of new museums and installations over the course of a half century in every corner of the United States. His projects include Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, and the Smithsonian's National Museum of American of African American history and culture. He curated and wrote six blockbuster exhibitions at the New York Historical Societies on slavery in New York and revolutions in the Atlantic world reborn. His writings include the spiritual self in everyday life, curating America, journeys through the storyscapes of the American past and objects of love and regret, a Brooklyn story to be published next week.
Among his many awards, Richard has received honors from the American Association of Museums, the American Association for State and Local History, and the Herbert Feist Award from the American History Historical Society, and the fellowship in the and a fellowship in the humanities from the Guggenheim Foundation. Please welcome to the screen Richard Rabinowitz. Let me snag you here, Richard. Thank you, Alice, <clears throat> and thank, thank you, Roger, for creating Right America and uh, for giving me a chance to reconnect with uh, Roger as a kind of eternal spring of inspiration for me over the course of my life. So this is, this is yet another occasion. Um, and um, I thought that I would read some of the pieces uh, of uh, Objects of Love and Regret, which is coming out, as Alice says, next week. Um, so I'll, I'm going to read the first chapter, uh, the beginning of the first chapter, uh, and then I'll jump around a little bit in the book and try to try to give you a sense of uh, what I was trying to do. It overlaps a lot with what Edvidge had just been talking about, I think, and of course we didn't know that until we got here tonight, so I, I think we're you're primed for some interesting kinds of conversation. The first chapter of my book is called Sarah Buys a Bottle Opener. I can almost make her out descending the steel edge stairs of the Livonia Avenue station on the BMT line on an April afternoon in 1934. She comes down the right side slowly, carefully. Her sensible tree mark shoes find the middle of each stair. She shies a little to the left, away from the rust-speckled handrails that have been soiled by a hundred thousand fingers since their last repainting. The ruder men speed by, colliding with her and with one another, racing toward the streets below. Others halt at the bottom where I stand to light up their cigarettes. My eyes catch her halfway down, and I want to run up the stairs against the traffic and guide her passage down. She is my mother and I am 11 years away from being born. But in picturing this scene, I wish I could protect her, wrap her in the safety of my arms and my comforting words, just as I remember how she comforted me so often. Tatala, she would say to me, in that lovely, loving, lovely and strange way that Yiddish endearments use the term for little father to embrace their littlest boys. <clears throat> Tatala, you'll be okay. Nishka Felak, it's not so terrible. I hear her say, I'm so tired, I can hardly move myself. She has spent a long work day, maybe 10 hours, snipping away the loose threads on a cheap dress made in the, in the shop on 36th Street, then being called away to the front office to try on this model or that one so the boss could make a sale, and finally coming back to arrange the finished stock on the carts for shipping, a dollar or two for 10 hours work. I can't say anything about the job that it's barely tolerable, tolerable and totally necessary. I want to say, Mamala, it's going to be fine. This city, this country, this time, it's pure faith. There's nothing in that Friday afternoon noise and dirt to reassure her. Nor can I climb the stairs to reach her. Of course not. I'm only there as an imagined witness, a historian in waiting. I can only guess at how she clutches her handbag, pulls her spring coat closed, and walks up the street away from the L. A few blocks away at Blake Avenue, she is amidst the push carts of a street market. A smiling Chesterfield smoker painted on a tenement wall, it satisfies. Looms over peddlers eager, eager to get rid of the last bulbous that is potatoes or cibola onions before they close up their carts for Shabbos. Sarah, that's her name, Sarah Schwartz, originally Sora Fruma Bat David Vishanka, heads for a push cart selling implements, useful things, egg beaters, mouse traps, ladles. She reaches over to a box of wooden handled bottle openers and picks out a green one. The peddler says, Funafin Zwanzig, 25 cents. And Sarah responds, Twansik, last week it was 20 cents. She's been waiting all week to buy it. He shrugs. She places two dimes in his pocket and slips, and she slips the bottle opener into her handbag. This is the actual bottle opener. 
Sarah, Sarah turns back to Livonia Avenue and crosses under the elevated subway tracks. She can hardly hear herself think above the rattling of the train overhead. She picks her way against the tide of tired workers coming from both directions, rambunctious children, baby carriages as tall as the weary mothers who push them, and rickety tricycles. The city seems to have disgorged all the detritus of the work week onto these streets, its people and every single thing they have used up since the previous Sunday. And finally, Sarah turns the corner onto Williams Avenue and sees the endless row of dirt great gray four-story apartment buildings lining the streets, treeless, shadeless, and windblown. Of the hundreds along the street, three or four windows display small wooden cottage cheese boxes with newly planted zinnias, each probably a project of a fifth grade pupil. Sarah skirts the, the shoulder slumped pedestrians to walk along the gutter. There are only a few cars. She has to step gingerly over discarded newspapers, candy wrappers, cigarette butts, bus tran transfers, dog waste, and small, boy small boy's piss. On the pavement, she tiptoes around a girl's game of potsy hopscotch, and she maneuvers between pink and black blotches of ancient chewing gum, so many that it seems that the sidewalk is actually held together by abandoned bits of double bubble chiclets and juicy fruit. When she looks up, Sarah sees her mother perched at the window of the third floor apartment. They wave to each other. The shake of her mother's head tells her that her brother Isaac is late again. Climbing the stairs to arrive at the family apartment, Sarah is eager to share her purchase of the bottle opener. But at the front door, she's totally distracted by the smell of the fresh baked challah. As she is on every Friday night, Sarah is ambivalent, happy that she's earned some money for the family, but guilt ridden for not having helped her mother prepare the home for Shabbos. I'm going to jump to a little bit later, actually earlier in the story, six years earlier. This is about the arrival in New York in 1928, when Sarah arrives with her mother and two younger brothers. Even 70 and 80 years later, Sarah Schwartz Rabinowitz beamed with pleasure in remembering her arrival alongside her mother and brothers in New York on Sunday, August 26, 1928. After a nine day passage from Antwerp, she thought the Statue of Liberty looked so gorgeous in the morning light. At least that's how she remembered it. In fact, August 16th, August 26th, was a cool and rainy day, a relief to New Yorkers who had suffered through a brutally hot August, during which 26 people had died of sunstroke. With the closing of Ellis Island's immigrant station in 1924, ships like the SS Belgeland of the Red Star Line carried its passengers, including those in third class steerage, right past the statue to dock at a pier on Manhattan's west side. For Sarah, this was the moment she had long awaited. The minute the boat came in, I recognized my father, even after six years apart. After her father, David Schwartz showed his naturalization papers to the United States officials, and her mother, Schenke, brought forward the visas issued in Warsaw for herself and the three children. It was not hard to get away from the boat, Sarah said. The family sheltered under two umbrellas that David had brought. A porter helped them to a taxi stand where a newsboy called out the headlines of a terrible subway crash at Times Square just two days earlier. Death toll reaches 18, dozens at hospitals. Even without understanding a word of English, Sarah knew immediately that New York was a far cry from the bucolic shtetl she had come from, Visoka Mazowiecka. They crowded into a car, my first taxi ride, she remembered, and they were off to their first American home on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Questions and more questions. Sarah's mind couldn't stop racing. What kind of a place was this? She'd been to visit 
Bialystok and Warsaw in Poland, but New York was so much larger and busier. What would her life be like here? Could she learn to speak English? How about school? Would she find friends? How about the cousins she had never met? What was her papa like? Did he know a lot about New York? What would life, what would life be like with the five of us all together again? How would mama and papa get along? How would mama's health be after all the turmoil of her years in Poland? Sarah couldn't focus. Her brothers kept sliding off the jump seats, giggling, making Papa nervous. Still wearing their overcoats, the newcomers were hot and sticky in the cab, and Dovid opened the window until the rain began to come in. Discomfort competed with excitement. The sky seemed to disappear. Even on a Sunday afternoon, the streets were more crowded than anything she had ever seen. Her head swung left and right, barely catching a glimpse of this and that. Stalled by a traffic jam on the Bowery, Sarah was nauseated at the smell of rotting and stinking garbage on the streets. Later in life, Sarah wondered whether there had been a sanitation workers strike, but there's no evidence of that. Like many newcomers to the city then and now, she may simply have been overwhelmed by the ordinary piles of uncollected trash. The wooden houses and unpaved, hard-packed dirt streets of the shtetl had been much cleaner than this filthy place so full of litter and broken things. The taxi pulled up in front of the dilapidated tenement at 350 Madison Street. Papa paid the fare and led the way out. He prevailed upon the taxi driver to help him bring the family's trunk, plastered over with travel stickers, through the front door, up into the hallway, and up the steep and narrow steps to their second floor apartment. The children followed. Sam joyfully stomping his boots on the steel front steps, Isaac hauling a little ba bag that kept banging against his knees. Sarah held her mother's hand. The dark day got darker when they passed through the front door. The cave-like hallway was lit only by a single dim bulb. As they ascended the creaky wooden stairs, they could see cracks of light from doorways opening on either side, neighbors checking to see who was moving in. The front door of their apartment led into a tiny windowless kitchen with a single faucet, a large wash tub, and a small enamel top work table. They walked through to the larger front room where their trunk had been deposited. They could hardly turn around in the space. Sarah remembered that her father had assembled such a mishmash of chairs and tables and beds, you'd think a hurricane had dropped all of this into the rooms. Sarah had bought a, por excuse me, David had bought David had bought a porcelain platter and a galvanized white pitcher for milk and a smaller matching bowl for sour cream. On the dining table, he placed bowls of salad. It was my mother's first view of tuna salad and nearly her last, she would recall, seven decades later. She also remembered that a horrible cake thing sat in the middle of the table, the icing proclaiming welcome to America in English script. The newcomers, still queasy from the ocean voyage, could stomach little of this. Though they yearned for a bed on terra firma, they, David insisted on having each of them first drink a bottle, a whole bottle of citrate of magnesia, a powerful laxative, quote, to get all of Europe out of their system. Schenker refused, already in nearly constant discomfort from all ulcers. The three children, therefore, took turns over the course of the next 12 hours in trekking to the filthy toilet in the tenement hallway. Sarah could recall nothing. She could recall mice or rats running across her feet. Nothing in Visoka Mazabiesk had been this disgusting. The next morning, Sarah characteristically took matters into her own hand. With a few nickels from her father, she went to a nearby hardware store, purchased a heavy brush and cleaning liquid, scrubbed down the toilet walls and floors, put a lock costing two cents, she recalled, on the door and gave a key to each of the residents of that second floor. Mrs. Katzman, the landlady, was not so thrilled at my mother's brash Grina Tuchus, immigrant posterior, but she finally stopped screaming long enough to recognize that this was a good idea. And though she lived on the fourth floor, the landlady began to use the much nicer toilets on the second floor where Sarah kept things spick and span. So I think I'll stop here and see if we can have some conversation. So thanks for listening.
Wow, well, Richard, um, I have to tell you that um, reading Curating America, I've been in silent conversation with you. I don't know if you've heard me during <laughs> these past several weeks uh, um, because your work resonated um, in so many ways, not only in the immediate ways in which, uh, of, of course, um, um, it resonated as far as the Triangle Fire, the memorial, the commemoration, and, and this particular essays, but really thinking about about so much of my work as, a, as an educator, as a writer and teacher of memoir and, and, and as an immigrant. But now that you've read uh, from this new book, uh, um, <laughs> there is more. <laughs> so I, um, I was thinking of something uh, just as you read. And one, one concept I found really um, um, striking um, and, and, and important uh, in curating America is the way in which you talk about the visitor and the role of the visitor and 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 the engagement of the visitor with the storyscape with the with with the, with the historical event with the object uh, um, that has been a lot on my mind and and as I'm listening to you reading this beautiful memoir work um, uh, do you think the narrator of this memoir is a curator or a visitor or a little bit of both? Well, you know, Edviga, I started my career uh, in the museum world um, as a one of those people you go and visit who is a, a costumed interpreter. And I this was at an outdoor museum in Massachusetts, and I was portraying the role of a 19th century farmer. And I was trying in that time to get into the, the sense of what it was like to walk on those on those roads, to breathe that air, to go to the work, to try to to work. I was, I was a schoolmaster, I played it sometimes, and I would I would try to think what was it like to try to write in a room that didn't have a lot of that only had a little bit of light, a little candlelight. So I've always been interested in, in reenacting scene in the past. And then gradually I began to understand that my writing, like this book, is really all about going back into those scenes, trying to find out as a historian as much as I could about the pushcart market, the, the, the subway, and trying to feel it in a sensory palpable way and trying to get into these characters heads and to be um, to try to understand their hearts and their the, the anxieties they had so i understand you know when you walk down those streets in what we now think of as greenwich village or soho and we think about them not as they are now parts of a consumer culture with Japanese restaurants, but really as a home for these Italian immigrant women. It's very much a similar kind, you know, I think you've been in, your, your writer in that story is actually doing some of the same work of really putting herself into those, those roles. I found that extremely powerful just to see the, the connection between those things. Of course, my mother was a, a, a seamstress and she was very nervous about that kind of life about everything about it it was it was not a not a pleasant time in her life and uh to do that and she she tells the story of really um of going and working for one day and she made a, um, a dollar the man gave her a dollar the the, the operator of the f factory and then he came up to her and he said could you lend me 20 cents i need the subway i need to get on the, i need a dime he needed a dime because the subway was a nickel he needed a he needed a dime to go back to work he didn't have a dime so he, she gave him from her dollar that he had paid her she gave him a dime and he, she said is there work here tomorrow and he said no not tomorrow come in on thursday and she came up on thursday and on the on the door said close everything in this shop was gone okay. was nothing was there and you know that sense of desperation and uh, it, living in that kind of world. Um, so I think I think we share that kind of interest in how to make those lives, how to find 
dignity and creativity and passion in those in those uh, and politics you know that's the other thing um, about it is those people thought of themselves as citizens and as having uh, power to make change in their in their world um, that's that was great so I've always been both a visitor and the <laughs> and the host in a sense, the person who agreed. That's always been such the way I think about teaching um, is through that. Thank you. You know, certainly, um, you know, when, when um, Marianne and I were editing these essays from some of our contributors, we were really trying to do, um, to get them to try to reconstruct uh, these stories. And, and it's interesting how, um, family members uh, um, had memories and records uh, um, that they could use, but then there were writers like Anne Lanzilotto who used uh, their imagination or, or their contemporary experience uh, or drew on their uh, visceral sense of coming from an immigrant background, even though it was not uh, um, um, directly related to tri triangles. So I guess we all connect with whatever materials that helped us get there. Well, I think it's interesting. I think I, I say in this book that I, I, I've i loved to write to to write about pe the people I like to write about are people who wrote their autobiographies with pots and pans in the kitchen rather than with pen and ink in the library. There are plenty of wonderful historians who, who study people who write in libraries and I have been trained and I love those people but I love studying those people. There is something to be, there's a whole enormous, perhaps the majority of mankind, of course, are not writers and don't leave behind documents. And to, we have to find ways to bring their lives out, to see the, their lives. They're not deficient or thinned out by their experience. And so the materiality, so in this book, I chose to find 11 objects, one object in each chapter, not heirlooms, not very, very wealthy, very uh, uh, precious objects, but objects that would really help me get into the, the how, get into the, the, the actions, the, the emotions, the heart uh, of each of these people. And um, when I talk to people about it, it turns out everybody has these kinds of objects that are triggers of memory that you can find in your background, in your past. Um, you know, when you were in Catania, which is a place I love, Sicily, and when you, you the palpable past uh, is, is a real gateway mm -hmm. to understand people. And it's so easy for us to generalize and characterize and, and talk about the social process and generalizations like that, and but to really get to the particularities of families, of individuals, what does a teenage girl, what's going on in her mind when she's going to work in that, in that terrible, on that terrible uh, morning in, uh, in 1913? Um, it's, it's an important question. Yeah. Absolutely. and and. The work I think that the, you know that I felt I I had to do and my co-editor and the writers was not just uh, you know as a, as a, you know as I'm sure it, it was with this particular project and 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 with the incredible reconstructions um, that you have done in the in in your many many projects it's it's also spiritual work and you know. Reading your book, one of the things that, that, that I was trying, you know, I was looking for connections and so curating. And, and I, it dawned on me that in Italian, editor um, and is not, it's translated a cura di. So mm -hmm. it's curated by. Um, and, and so I started, you know, thinking and doing a little bit of research. There was a Roman goddess, um, cura. And she created the first human being uh, from humus, so homo, uh, but was made of clay and she needed breath. So she asked Job to give breath and Job liked it so much that wanted to claim the creature. 
Um, and so a dispute arose and then Saturn decided, okay, Jove gets the soul after, souls after death, the earth gets the bodies after death, and, um, and Kura um, gets uh, get the body during life. And, and so I was thinking of this notion of Kura, Kura is care, concern, but Kura in Italian and in Latin also means uh, worry, anxiety, huh. trouble. And, and I was thinking of, you know, the, all the projects that you have done of recovery of the past, and I was thinking of my role as editors and and the places they have they have taken me to, and and how it taps, how it comes from something that is very profound. So you send me on my own particular search. Where does it come from? So where does this this desire to dig into the past, recover it? create a place of dignity, attention, and care come from for you on a visceral level, not on an intellectual level? Well, even in the, the beginning, the first lines, when I wrote that, I didn't realize that a lot of it came from this desire, to be honest, to, to, to take care of my mother. My mother lived to be 99 and a half. She had a very difficult time. She was born in the middle of World War I in Poland, a battlefield, basically. Um, and uh, and my grandfather had been taken away for a year by the Cossacks, and, and they had lived in this terrible circumstance. And my great-grandfather had, and I tell the story, had tried to, he was a metal worker, and he tried to pick up a shell, uh, like the kind of thing we see now on television in Ukraine, um, he tried to pick up a shell that he could, he thought was, would be good material to make, to make pots and pans with, and it blew up and it killed him. And that's my mother's earliest memory. And yet she lived a life of considerable comfort at the end of her life, finally, not with very, you know, with tremendous frugality. So I think when I wrote that first page, I realized and I look back on it, and I look back on it now, it's obviously the impulse was to hold my mother again, to just, you know, I started it after, after her death. I, I, in fact, it came out of a kind of understanding I had during the eulogy that I wrote that I'm not getting this woman right. I don't really know her well enough. But I also have to say that there's a little bit of anger in, in in uh, the way in which people like my mother are, and immigrants today, are treated, and the kind of insult, you know, I still can feel that pain of, of coming to this country and feeling that rejection, and, you know, not, she couldn't get a chance to go to high school at all, uh, and uh, so she, so there's a certain kind of anger that I'm still trying to deal with. And it leads to a kind of ambivalence about you know, this country and the promise of this country. As a historian, especially historians of American Jews tend to pro propound a mythology of a kind of inevitable, especially the, the, the Jews who came in the great wave of migration from the 1881 to 1930, let's say that there's a kind of inevitable upward mobility. But there are many, many people who were poor and didn't succeed and didn't, didn't triumph in America. And we have not written those stories. And the same thing is true of Italian Americans. It, is, it's, it was a successful migration for many, many people. But the suffering and the pain and the people who were left behind and, you know, so I think it's my job to represent those voices as well. So part of it is just love, caring, but if part of it is just, I'm really pissed off at the way in which, you know, we leave people in the lurch and we're doing it, we do it all the time. So this is part of what I think writing and Roger's idea of writing America brings us in touch, not just with our own stories or our family stories or the historical stories, but with the contemporary uh, dilemma that we face. And um, anyway, I think that's... Well, it's a perfect answer because it really fits this notion of core as being a combination of 
care and anxiety and I love water. that idea you know and I love the fact of both Italians and Jews you know have this kind of this intake yeah. of breath and this kind of sigh taking air into you and it's it's uh, it's a really interesting thing just uh, to to <laughs> To think of what that means and what the way the breath becomes so expressive, uh, even without specific language. Right? And, and just very quickly to follow up on what you said, uh, you know, these these uh, the 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 upward mobility story continues not to be true for everyone. You know, one one of the things that was very moving for me when I was teaching the Triangle Fire course uh, during the lockdown. Uh, is that so many of my students were essential workers and they really related to uh, the triangle workers that their experiences of really having to risk their lives uh, uh, was something that was uh, so powerful, so compelling. Um, so lots of connections uh, to this day. Yeah. We do have some questions in the chat that I thought I would share with you. Laura asked, I love history and I have the same curiosity about being alive back in the day. Did your characters create themselves through your historical research or do they appear in your imagination first? Well, I, go ahead. I think, I think, you know, I'm dealing almost always, I have this, my, my mother was a person of fact. She, she would not read uh, Peter Pan to my sister because she didn't think that boys could fly. So she was not a person who was interested in fantasy or anything like that. So she would, she grew up with fact. And somehow or another, I've imbibed that idea that I really find it very hard to invent. I've never been able to write fiction. Uh, I would love to. I love reading fiction, studying it, writing about it, but I can't do it. Uh, so for me, it always starts with some story that I have found a fragment of, and then trying to find a, a way of bringing that story to life, bringing that story to the audience, to the public, in a way that that makes sense, that makes that helps people make more sense of of their lives. So um, uh, I wish I had the imagination. You know, I have a quotation on my computer. It says, without imagination, no man can follow another through these halls, which comes from Moby Dick, which is my my most important book. But I'm not sure I've got the, the chops uh, for that. So that's that's, that's a great question. Um, hey, Vige, do you have a thought on that? Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> many thoughts. Well, for one thing, you know, uh, I love the you know, the having the object, you know, you have uh, the, um, let me just grab this. You have, uh, you have the bottle opener. I have my mother, my father's hat. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, it's great. Because my father's voice is one of, uh, one of the voices uh, in my head. I think objects are powerful vehicles to, to commune with the dead and let them speak to us and tell us stories. I think there are stories that and voices that we hear, but um, we have to get out of our own way in order to be able um, um, to write them. I, I think in reconstructing um, ancestors, there is always, always a combination of different things. There is always a little bit of imagination. I mean, you, you, you know, <laughs> even you, Richard, can deny that there is some <laughs> imagination. Um, and, and, and also uh, historical research uh, and archival research, even when it doesn't pertain exactly to your uh, family member, because there might be no record, it can give you information that then you can use to do this delicate work of imaginative reconstruction. And I love memoir because uh, it really posits the truth of memory. This is not right. complete veracity. and and, and I was thinking about the what is both the frustration that comes from when uh, the stories that we have heard and the archival records are in conflict with each other and, and so which is true. But that is also the beauty and the power of memoir. 
this tension between these different accounts. And I think uh, um, the story that we tell, uh, the imaginative account is born out of that. That's great, yeah. There's another question from Joshua. We seem to be at a wonderful intersection of history and story, which can be lacking in some history classes, at least in my memory of two undergraduate history courses I had to take. How have you both conceived of your own writing and curating work as pedagogical? Pedagog pedagogical? How do the stories you both work with in, in turn work on your students as individuals and as members of communities? Sorry, I slaughtered that, but. Maybe go, go, you, you're the teacher. <laughs> well, I think I, I will I say that you're the teacher too. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that um, a little that I try to incorporate history and story, and I'm not a historian. I am not. I was telling this. <laughs> I was confessing right before we started. I'm no historian, but being able to create access to history and story for students uh, in any class uh, um, can be truly transformative. Right now, I'm teaching a course on Virginia Woolf. Uh, and Luis de Salvo. Um, Luis de Salvo was Virginia Woolf biographer and a memoirist. Uh, and it's opening the doors uh, to examining um, World War II from the point of view of Virginia Woolf, uh, who committed suicide in 1941. And Luis de Salvo, who, who was born in 1942, a year later, whose father, um, um, went to war in the Pacific, and she writes about that in her memoir. So it's quite wonderful the way in which students can look at historical accounts or through these personal narratives, uh, and then uh, from there can be led uh, to reflect uh, on other historical events that are part of their family history and family memory. Well, we are winding up. Oh, uh, go ahead, Richard. I, I just want to say I think this this conversation points up another thing, which is that it's important to invite students to become part of a learning community. So when we have these conversations and we see these connections, you know, and we become we see how much we can learn from one another, and that's part of what the process uh, of dealing with common texts and common objects and things like that is actually to see find a way to knit together the students instead of thinking of them as isolated individuals who are struggling to gain in mastery all, all on their own but inviting them to become to construct communities and that's important well as we wind up this hour i have a couple of questions to ask of you and i'm bringing them back to books because you are both authors and I want to bring it back to uh, some of your research and some of your work. Um, Edvige, what emerging author do you think we might have missed that you would like to share with us? Well, one is Anne Lanzilotto's wonderful essay I read uh, from and she has many wonderful books uh, of memoir and also uh, poetry that and I would really highly recommend her and I am a teacher. So I would really like uh, to, to call to your attention, uh, Crystal Sital, if you don't have a memoir secrets we kept. Uh, um, it's a wonderful memoir of uh, women from Trinidad. Uh, and I had the privilege of being Crystal's teacher uh, when she was a student at New Jersey City University. So those are- Thank you. Thank Can you. I give you one more? Absolutely. We like learning about new people. So I'm very excited because I'm waiting for the galleries of uh, this book, this Italian book uh, that I've been wanting to see in English translation for many, many years. And because it's a book about women and mafia, um, it was impossible to find a publisher um, that was interested because the Godfather narratives are really the popular ones. It's called Song to the Desert, Story of Tina Mafia Soldier by Maria Rosa Cotrufelli and um, it would be published by Saul Press. Thank you. Uh, Richard, have you been on any literary pilgrimage where you went somewhere to do some research that was so fascinating you want to share that adventure with us? Well, you know, 
I, I always, when we do these exhibitions, I always feel as though I have to go and see the landscape. The most dramatic and exciting and terrifying, of course, for me was to go to Haiti mm. um, to work on the history of the Haitian Revolution, which historians now understand is one of the most important transformative events of the last 500 years. And um, I went with a wonderful older man on a trek. We climbed up this mountain. We were tracking down a story about a family um, that had left Haiti, uh, left Saint-Domingue, the French colony that became the, the nation of Haiti. And, um, and a woman who had left the port and gone to New Orleans, created a family and then come back. And we got, we climbed up seven hours. We went to the top of this hill through this very complicated uh, landscape. And we got to the top and we found these people and they told us stories that came out of a kind of, almost they had, they had made a kind of myth almost. I don't mean that in any negative sense, but the, of the people that we were searching for, and we found this in, at the top of this hill, at the top of this uh, in, in Haiti. Through a, and we and I remember saying we were very thirsty, of course, and they would not let us drink the water because it really wasn't safe. So they would split open coconuts and we would drink the coconut milk uh, in there. So that was a case where research had sort of jumped from the archive into something much, much more powerful. And, in general, I think you know historians just need to get out, need to get out more, uh, and into that kind of landscape. I, I wanted to. I was thinking about a, a book to suggest to you, and I've just finished this book, which has just come out. It's called *The Sewing Girl's Tale*, um, a story of crime and consequences in revolutionary America, by John Wood Sweet. It's a young historian who's written about a rape case in 1793 in New York, and it's a brilliant evocation of a girl's, 17-year-old girl's life preyed upon by uh, a wealthy dandy, and, but it's just an extraordinarily evocative study of, of old, old New York, not sentimental at all, but it's very powerful story and and unusual for being i mean this is really written by a literary artist uh john mm -hmm. would so i i would that's if you said to me is there a book that i think would would demonstrate what a historian could do with great research but also with imagination that's that's one book i really want to recommend it's just out i think it was a front page review in the New York Times book review some time ago, but it's it's needs much more attention. So. Thank you. I always love attention. And also, I want to know what each of you is reading right now, because I do sell books for a living. So I want to know what's on your nightstand. What are you reading? Well, I am uh, um, rereading uh, Mrs. Dalloway uh -huh. and Dubliners. <laughs> I have I have several books uh, that I want uh, to read, uh, um, but it's just quite wonderful to return to these old loves after after many years. You're I, not alone. You're not alone. There's a lot of people going back to some really great literature, so that's great to hear. Richard, um, what are you I, up to? Well, I yeah, going back every ten years or so, I read Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, which I read, of oh, course. Wow as a son and then I read it as a when I was a father and a son and and then I read it when I'm you know now I'm a father a son and a grandfather um so every that's a book that keeps speaking to me in new ways but I'm also in a book group and we're starting to read Proust the whole thing and and for people who are interested in memory <laughs> This is extraordinary um, stuff. And I think I'm almost old enough now to begin to understand what he was up to. And uh, so I've, I'm, I'm well into the first of the, of the seven novels. And um, it's got a new, there's a new edition of it. So I have an excuse for, 
for I'm so envious because I have to I have to read certain things I don't have the leisure time you guys obviously have carved out for yourself so but I do want to thank you for this evening uh we do need to wrap it up and so I will say farewell to the two of you thank you thank oh, you of course thank you so much and I would like to thank Ed Veach and Richard for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We will not meet, however, this coming Monday, but hope to see you all next week on a special Wednesday episode on September 28th as we welcome Rose Styron, Edward Hirsch, and Elizabeth Hawes Weinstock. Please remember to check out our Birds Book Write America page where you can find out information about our upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you. Bye.